Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. During most of the Cenozoic, the island continent of South America sat in relative isolation. Although there were periods of contact with other land masses, most famously with Africa during the second half of the Eocene, which brought the ancestors of cavimorph rodents and New World monkeys to South America, the continent's fauna remained strongly endemic. The best known examples of this endemism were the predatory metatherian sporacidonts, the terror birds, and the many lineages of so-called meridiungulates. I've covered many of these groups on this channel before, the most recent of which being the incredibly diverse notoungulates, which filled niches ranging from rabbit to wombat to rhino-like. While these were the most common and variable of the South American ungulates, in second place were another significant group, the Litopterns. These animals first appear in the fossil record during the Paleocene, and tended to broadly resemble the ungulates found on the northern continents, in this case being similar to early horses, deer, gazelles and camels. Like other meridiungulates, the relationship of the Litopterns to other mammals remained a mystery for many decades. However, recent studies that have analysed collagen samples from the youngest known Pleistocene members of this clade have found Litopterns to be closely related to modern Perissodactyls, diverging from them roughly 66 million years ago. If this turns out to be correct, which seems likely given anatomical similarities between these groups, particularly in the structure of the feet, then the ancestors of Litopterns may have migrated south from North America, close to the Cretaceous-Paleocene boundary. We know that other animal groups made this transition at about the same time, including Metatherian mammals, Basal Pantodonts, and the Titanosaur Alamosaurus. In their new homeland, the ancestors of the Litopterns thrived and diversified, given the recent extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. Potentially the most basal and unspecialised forms were the Didolodontids, once thought to be condyloths, that wastebasket group containing all basal ungulates. More recent studies have suggested that these animals may be close relatives of Litopterns. Possessing flat bunodont molars, five-toed feet, and very unspecialised body plans complete with long tails, the Didolodontids are probably still omnivorous, and were quite similar in appearance to the Phenacodontids of the northern continents. This group was particularly common in Argentina during the Paleocene and Eocene, with the best known form being the genus Didolodus, which is the only member of the clade to have images of it online. Native to the Middle Eocene of Argentina between 40 and 37 million years ago, this dog-sized animal measured about 60 centimetres or 2 feet long. Its legs were relatively short, with Didolodus standing on digit-grade feet, enabling it to be an agile, forest-dwelling ungulate, somewhat similar to the early horses. The structure of its teeth suggests that this genus was a relatively unspecialised herbivore that fed on relatively soft vegetation, fruit, and perhaps even carrion or insects on occasion. Another basal group that had been linked to the Litopterns were the Colpaniids, which were among the very oldest South American ungulates. All of these were small, forest-dwelling herbivores with very generalised body plans and low-crowned molars indicating a diet composed mainly of fruit and soft plants. One of the better known forms, Molinodus, native to the early Paleocene Tiupampa site in Bolivia. This was a squirrel-sized animal, measuring up to 30 centimetres long, and closely resembling many other basal ungulate groups from the northern continents, having an elongated body, short legs, and a heavy tail. Interestingly, Colpaniids have so far only been found at Tiupampa and nowhere else with the group not persisting beyond the Paleocene. They are also probably very similar to the first ungulates that arrived in South America from the north at the very beginning of the Cenozoic, but were then outcompeted by their more derived relatives. More recognisable true Litopterns first started to appear by the end of the Paleocene, with these already having developed a digitigrade posture that enabled fast running in contrast to most other meridiungulates of the time, which remained plantigrade walkers. This would set the course for their successful later diversification. Good examples of such early forms were animals such as Proliptera, from the late Paleocene early Eocene Itaburai formation of Brazil, a tiny rabbit-sized animal that dwelt in a tropical forested environment. Proliptera would have somewhat resembled a modern chevrotain and lived much like one as well, being a shy, skittish ungulate that fed on low-growing soft vegetation. A close relative, A. Smith Woodwardia, was present at the same site and was a bigger animal, about the size of a large hare. 
These proto-lit turnids were quite typical of early Lithopterns in being small, fast-running forest dwellers, with most members of the clade remaining this way until the Miocene. An exception to this were the Spana theriodontids, which tended to be more massive and heavily built. Also appearing in the fossil record during the late Paleocene, these were among the few South American ungulates to successfully migrate into Antarctica, along with the Astrapotheres. Being rare animals, they were probably somewhat selective browsers like living tapirs. The genus Notiolophos was endemic to what is now Seymour Island, Antarctica, across the Eocene period between 55 and 34 million years ago. Two species are known, with the older of these, N. rugeroi, being about the size of a sheep and weighing up to 57 kilograms. The younger species, N. arcintiensis, was much larger, with a mass of around 400 kilograms, comparable to a living muskox. This increase in size may be due to the gradual cooling of the continent as the Eocene progressed. While the climate of Antarctica at this time was far warmer than it is today, being cool, temperate, and covered by forests composed of conifers and southern beech, the region still experienced long, dark winters that lacked sunlight for several months. Other Spanotheriodontids were present across southern South America as well, with these similarly being the largest of the Paleocene Lithopterns. The group died out at the end of the Eocene for reasons that are not entirely clear, but are probably related to the cooling and drying trends going into the Oligocene. Lithopterns would not develop such large sizes again until the Miocene. A very successful group of more derived Lithopterns were the small to medium-sized Prototheriids, which filled ecological niches similar to those of small deer, gazelles, and especially early horses. Most were slender, fast-running animals with largely browsing diets, with most of their weights ported on the middle toe, much as in modern Perissodactyls. Early forms had on three-toed feet, but the most derived species possessed only a single hoof on each foot, converging on the condition in living equids. It seems that this family generally became more gracile as they developed, with the most basal known genus, Megadolodus, being a fairly stout, sheep-sized animal, native to the middle Miocene tropical forests of Colombia between 13 and 11 million years ago. This animal possessed crushing bunodont molars and sharp canine tusks, which suggested it lived like a peccary, browsing on foliage as well as consuming roots, fruit, and perhaps invertebrates. Another fairly atypical form was the late Miocene early Pliocene genus Dysplasiotherium, which was a heavily built browser about the size of a cow and was certainly not built for fast running. The most famous Prototheriids, however, were relatively small, fast animals, such as the Miocene genus Diodaphorus, which was a sheep sized runner that strongly resembled early North American horses such as Merikippus, placing its weight on an enlarged singular middle toe while the remaining two digits were held off the ground. This would have made the genus better at escaping from fast predators, such as the forest rachid terabirds. Its low-crowned molars suggest a browsing diet of soft leaves. The related Thoatherium was quite similar, but smaller, measuring just 70 centimeters long, and perhaps resembling a modern gazelle. Like horses of the genus Equus, this small Lithopterm possessed only one enlarged hoof on each foot, and had lost all traces of the splint bones, which were the remnants of the second and fourth toes. Prototheriids thrived until the late Miocene, when their diversity began to drop, probably due to the cooling and aridifying climate of the time, reducing their favoured forested habitats to be replaced by more open grassland. Despite their adaptations for fast running, these animals don't seem to have developed into any grazing forms, unlike the horses that they superficially resembled, which put them at a disadvantage as the climate shifted. The late Miocene was also detrimental to many other South American animal groups, including the Seebeckasuchians, Sporacidont metatherians, and the trunked Astrapotheres, all of which were not able to adapt to the more seasonal climatic conditions. It was once thought that the Prototheriids became extinct during the Pliocene, although recent discoveries have confirmed that the genus Neolicaphrium persisted into the late Pleistocene, being one of the youngest of all meridiungulates, alongside the related Macrochenia and the notoungulate Toxodon. It was a fast-running browser much like its earlier cousins, and was a small genus, being comparable to modestly sized modern deer such as Muntjacs and the South American Pampas deer. Dwelling in gallery forests and more open savanna woodlands in what is now Brazil, Argentina and Uruguay, Neolicaphrium would have lived much like a small deer, 
browsing on low-growing vegetation, it lived alongside familiar modern South American animals such as tapirs, peccaries, jaguars and capybaras. Although sadly this last prototherid was claimed by the end Pleistocene extinction event, the final and most famous group of lithopterids were the macrochenioids, which contains the small and obscure adianthids and the more well-known macrochenioids. Both first appeared during the Middle Eocene about 48 million years ago, with early forms of each family being vaguely deer or gazelle-like animals that dwelt in forested environments and would have been ecologically similar to the modern South American hoodoo deer. As the Cenozoic progressed, the continent began to shift to drier and more open ecosystems, with the macrochenioids responding by developing larger body sizes, with some forms becoming the most massive lithopterns to ever live. This transition occurred during the early Miocene, with macrochenioids developing into genera that more closely resembled living camelids, such as llamas and wanakos, albeit with three-toed feet similar to those of rhinos, and possessing protracted nasal openings, which probably supported a fleshy moose-like upper lip. Older reconstructions often gave these animals a short trunk, although modern research has disputed this. The early to mid-Miocene genus Theosodon was fairly typical of the group, and was still quite modest in size, measuring about 2 metres long, with long legs and neck, being about the size of a living wanako. Its nasal openings were positioned halfway up the snout rather than at the tip, which is thought to be an adaptation for feeding on thorny vegetation. The jaws were quite slender and narrow when compared to later members of this group, suggesting a selective browsing diet out on the warm open woodlands and savannas of Miocene South America. Macrochenioids continued to do well as the Miocene progressed, and survived the period of the Great American Interchange that occurred by around 2.5 million years ago, which saw the arrival of North American herbivorous mammals, such as horses, deer, camelids, and proboscideans. By the late Pleistocene, three genera remained, living alongside the northern herbivorous immigrants, and being hunted by the saber-toothed cat Smilodon. The most obscure of these was the genus Macrochineopsis, from the mid to late Pleistocene of Argentina, although little seems to be known about this animal. It lived alongside the more famous and well-known member of the family, which was Macrochenia itself. Native to the southern cone of South America, ranging from Peru to southernmost Patagonia, this genus has been featured in paleo documentaries many times, with perhaps the best remembered being in Walking with Beasts, where it was shown with a now probably outdated trunked nose, with current scientists suggesting that it more likely possessed a fleshy upper lip. It was a large animal, standing up to 2 metres or about 6.5 feet tall and weighing about a metric tonne, while generally resembling a humpless camel, albeit with three-toed feet. All the better to get away from large and intimidating predators, such as Smilodon populator and the giant short-faced bear Arctotherium, carbon isotope analysis of this animal's teeth have indicated that it was a mixed feeder, consuming both leaves and C4 grasses the discovery of multiple individuals at the same fossil sites, hinting that Macrochenia was a gregarious genus that lived in herds. A more northerly analogue, Xenorhinotherium, was native to eastern Brazil and Venezuela at the same time, being about the same size and filling a very similar niche. Unlike the Toxodontid notoungulates, the Lithopterns did not successfully move into Central America, and became extinct at the end of the Pleistocene about 11,000 years ago as did many megafaunal mammals throughout the Americas. The reasons for this are still debated, with climatic changes and human interference probably playing a role, although we are not sure to what extent. While it was once thought that the South American ungulates were somehow inherently inferior to those that arrived from North America during the Pliocene, Toxodontids and Lithopterns were able to survive well alongside the newcomers so direct competition was probably not responsible for their ultimate extinction. Indeed, four genera of Lithopterns and four genera of Toxodontids persisted until the end of the Pleistocene, suffering the same fate as many megafaunal animals across the northern continents. It is a great shame that they are all gone today, but we can still look back and marvel at these unique ungulates, with the Lithopterns being a great example of convergent evolution. No wonder Darwin was so enthused by them, Thanks for watching everyone. The next episode will be covering the early evolution of the sauropodomorph dinosaurs, which started out as small slender bipeds before evolving into the most massive land animals of all time. See you again soon. Cheerio.